uh, give everyone a few more minutes to join up. Thanks. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is the weekly Exit Advisors Town Hall series. Uh, we're in a deep into our third month doing this, so we're really excited to have everyone join and are, are thrilled with the participation that we've had thus far. Um, today we're gonna be featuring Gary Cooper, who's going to kick off the first of his three-part series focused around building a service business. Um, if, if you have questions during the presentation, please throw them in the chat. We'll address them during the Q&A session at the end. Uh, before I get into introducing Gary, I want to share a little bit of information about Exit Advisors. We are an M&A advisory firm based out of Houston that focuses on lower middle market businesses. But we are different than most banks and advisory groups and that we do not just simply serve as a transaction partner uh, during your M&A transaction. We work with entrepreneurs and business owners months or even years in advance to develop a tailored strategy for selling their business and to create actionable ways for them to increase the value of their business. Exit Advisors is also highly geared towards education. So that means we like to take a very collaborative approach by working with other service firms and business partners, B2B groups, to create a comprehensive team that works with their clients around those transactions. That also helps create a very powerful network of advisors that will help your service firm evolve and expand its offerings to those clients. Gary's going to probably speak to that here in a few minutes, um, but on to Gary, our managing partner of Exit Advisors and the president and CEO of Cooper CPA Group. Gary has a very distinguished career and with more than 35 years of public accounting experience and prior to starting his full service accounting firm and consulting group here in Houston. Gary built and operated a successful multi-million dollar accounting practice in Dallas, Texas. Gary's got expertise in every facet of the accounting world around tax planning, compliance, financial reporting, business valuation, and a full range of services offered and geared towards M&A and litigation support. But Gary isn't just a bean counter, he is also a seasoned entrepreneur that can relate to his clients on a different level. He's successfully built multiple practices from the ground up, heals eight patents. He's an active member of the Entrepreneurs Organization, and he served in that capacity as a board member and also as a mentor. Gary really does understand what it means to be an entrepreneur and a business owner when he works with his clients. So now that we've given him a little introduction, I wanna pass the reins over to him so he can kick things off. Go ahead, Gary. There you go. You're unmuted. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I, I really appreciate that introduction. Uh, it probably sounds uh, pretty ridiculous, but you know, it's been a great career. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed building service businesses and uh, of course, Exit Advisors uh, is such a great opportunity uh, to build another excellent service business. As Andrew said, we're we're really focused on education. We're focused on uh, collaborating with other professionals and uh, helping our customers. Uh, when, when you build a service business, that's, that's gotta be first and foremost, is helping your customers and, and really taking care of your human capital. Uh, and those two instances, I mean, you're really able to, to vault and build something special. And uh, that's what we've tried to build at Cooper CPA Group. And that's what we're building at Exit Advisors as well. We uh, all communicate well, we collaborate well, and uh, open communication is always critical. 
Um, okay, so this series we're going to go through uh, today. We're going to talk about company-specific risk associated with your practice. Uh, we're going to talk about the ins and outs of networking and digital marketing, and these are three very important aspects of, of having a successful service business or really having a successful business period. Uh, later, we're going to talk about uh, next session, human, human capital, uh, tracking and accountability, and then we're going to get into implementation of EOS. Uh, Jason Knight is my implementer who's on here today, and uh, it's a very great operating system that entrepreneurs can get in, put in place you know, to really understand core values and uh, understand accountability and uh, put the right people in the right seats. And then we'll talk a little bit about internal reporting and the importance of running your service business as a business. Uh, I've always said that I'm an entrepreneur running a CPA practice. Uh, I'm not a CPA running a business. And uh, not, not that that, you know, lessens the fact that I'm a CPA. It's just that you got to run any kind of business like a business uh, as an entrepreneur would. So let, let's kind of dive into concentration of credit risk a little bit. And, uh, you know, this is, this is true for any type of business that you have. Uh, there's a great book. It's called Built to Sell that, that I've read and I recommend to all of my potential clients and my network. And it's an interesting story. It, it's a, really about an advertising firm. And the individual goes to his mentor and says, hey, I want to sell my business. And, uh, you know, the mentor looks at everything that he's got and it says, well, your business really isn't worth anything. And he's questioning, well, what do you mean? I've got all these great clients. I've got these big clients. And, you know, the mentor says, well, you know, the problem is, is you do all the work. And you don't have uh, really a vision. You don't have repeatable income. And so this book really lays out a plan for an entrepreneur to take a look at this aspect of their business. So, you know, you got to look at uh, concentration of credit risk, obviously. You know, how many material customers do you have? Uh, are you a job shop? I mean, if that's the case, do you lose a material customer and you've lost 40% of your business or do you lose three of them and you lose 60% of your business? And, you know, obviously a potential purchaser will look at this with a little bit of fear and you're going to be looking at an earn out versus a cash price. So you really get, you know, when you're building the business, you've got to take that into consideration and how you select your customer base uh, and take into consideration, you know, you'd probably rather have a thousand customers than 10. Okay. Uh, involvement of owners. Th this is, with Exit Advisors, this is probably one of the largest concentration of credit risk issues or company specific risk uh, that we're faced with. It's when, when the owner wants to take on everything. And in the accounting profession, it, we're, we're notorious for that because uh, most accountants are control freaks. And, you know, we want to handle everything. We, we want to be the ones to talk to all of our clients. Uh, we want to review every tax return that goes out of the office uh, and just be involved in everything that has to do with the practice. Well, you know, if, if you're setting your business up to hopefully sell it in the future or transfer ownership, you, you've got to step back from that. You've got to have people. You've got to be able to delegate. Uh, you've got to go and become a leader. A leader of people and uh, if there's something else somebody else can do they ought to be doing it and and so I can encourage you to take a step and look at this and you now one thing I, an exercise I put clients through is, is draw out an organizational chart just a generic one and write down the name of the person who's doing each of these functions and I think if you see your name popping up throughout this organization chart you know that you've got an issue with too much involvement in the business and you need to hire people. And as EOS trains you, it's putting the right people in the right seat and then holding them accountable. Okay, billing rates and market rates. All right, this, this really has to do with pricing and any kind of service business. And it's something that we're really focused on at Cooper CPA Group. We, you know, we are, we take pride in having 100% uh, realization. So. The billing rates that, that we put out to our clients is actually what we bill. And uh, when I say 100% realization, we get our billing rates. 
And uh, that way there's complete transparency. The client knows what they're getting. We know what we're gonna bill. And then, you know, obviously through market research, if you're starting a service business, it's really, really critical that you do that market research, that, that you look at what kind of pricing is out there. You know, what, how, do I, how do I price myself? I mean, now there's, you know, there's a lot of value billing. And, and we like to do that. We, we like to come in and say, it's going to take us $1,000 to do your tax return, or it's going to take us $2,500 to do your tax return, instead of the client just giving them billing rates, and then they get you know, the surprise bill at the end of the month, which uh, upsets everybody. And so you know, looking at this, having proper reporting to where you're looking at your production, you're looking at your realization, uh, you know, you measure the fact, am I getting what I say my billing rates are? Do I need to adjust them? You know, and, and again, that comes along with market research as well. You know, finding out what your competitors are doing. And the problem with the accounting profession is it's all over the board. I mean, you've got people out there that's billing $75 an hour and you've got somebody with equal experience billing $350 an hour. So uh, it's really difficult. And, and other service industries, I'm sure you have uh, same issues as we have as an accountant. Uh, underemployed. Okay, so, you know, everybody worries about cost, right? I mean, it's like, you know, I've got to watch my costs. I've got to make sure that, you know, I've got my margins. But, you know, one of the worst things can happen is you're un underemployed. And so this has happened in a big way to the accounting profession. So uh, what happened to us as a profession as, you know, around the year 2000 is when IT got hot. So what happened is about 50% of the people who would normally major in accounting now majors in IT. So that basically cut the market in half. And, uh, you know, trying to find good people in the accounting profession is difficult. And I got to think that's probably holds true for law, risk management, and everything else. So you've got to have the people to do the work. Uh, I like to try to stay one person overemployed. That way, you know, we can go out and we can get new business and we can pull new clients in and we can make sure that we're properly communicating and we're taking care of them. Because realistically, probably 75% of all of my new business is because the client says the CPA is not returning the phone call or not returning emails. And so really, guys, we're in the service business, right? When you're in the service business, you're supposed to be providing a superior service. And so with that, having the proper level of human capital and being able to reach out and communicate to your customers is just absolutely critical. Okay, um, okay, inadequate financial records. Uh, and that's really interesting. I've, I've tried to buy several CPA firms and I've gone in to do uh, my due diligence, no different than what exit advisors would do, uh, going in looking at a company. And one of the greatest weaknesses I see in the accounting profession, and this is probably true with other service companies, is really inadequate financial records. And that, that goes along with, for instance, at Cooper CPA Group, we have a daily dashboard. Uh, we have totally up-to-date QuickBooks. Uh, we use a system called Practice for our billings. Uh, we, we track our realization uh, by employee, by, by client, by month. Uh, we, we track everything precisely. We have a budget at the beginning of each month, and uh, then I have a weekly analysis prepared for me, and I also have a monthly audit of my financial information. And Therefore, I really have a good understanding of what my numbers are saying. I have a good reading, an immediate reading. And what I've seen with other practices I've looked at, they don't. Uh, they're not really tracking realization. They're not, they're not tracking their production well. Uh, they don't have a handle on uh, standard billing rates. And, uh, you know, I can only give this as a benchmark in the accounting profession. Uh, you know, if you're a financial advisor, you're an attorney, you have a risk management company, I mean, you're going to have the same type of matrix in some sort. And it's really important for me to have that information. And, and I'm very much a visionary. I'm not as much an integrator as a lot of CPAs are. Uh, but having that reading, those numbers talk to me. I can, 
I can really pivot and uh, make decisions based on that internal financial information. Okay, so now let's, let's jump into something a little bit more exciting. I mean, uh, networking. So networking is something, when I moved to Houston, I, I remember I was kind of forced to move to Houston to a certain degree. I had a great accounting practice in Dallas. And my wife's family congregated to Houston. So one day we got up having coffee and she said, well, we're moving to Houston. And I was like, oh, okay. When? Uh, well, as soon as possible. So I made a deal. I said, okay, uh, tell you what, we'll put the house on the market for this price. And if we get this price in 10 days, I'll move. Well, we got it in two days. So I was moving to Houston. And I remember sitting at my backyard, uh, you know, looking around when I moved to Houston. I thought, you know, my office is 200 miles up the road. I have not one client in this city. Uh, this was 16 years ago. And, you know, I had to figure out quickly how I was going to build and uh, have a practice here. And so I went to a network meeting and uh, a friend of mine uh, and I decided at that network meeting, it would probably be best to build our own. And so we did. We, we built a networking group. It's no different than, I guess, you've heard of BNI, uh, you know, you've heard of uh, network in action, some of the others. I'm a member of High Rise now, which is a great network group. But we built our own, and we ended up having about 50 members in this network group. And, you know, it was great connectivity, and this particular group was really a leads group. Uh, it was understood that you could literally ask each other for business. You could ask each other for referrals, and it wouldn't be slanderous to do so. And you know, also what, what I did when I moved to Houston is I decided I want to meet as many people as I can. You know, that's going to be my goal in Houston, Texas. I want to go out. I want to meet people. I want to build, you know, collaboration with others. I, I want to be willing to refer business to other people. And I know that, you know, for some CPAs, that, that is kind of uncomfortable uh, to do so. You, you're kind of concerned about your client base and uh, but, but you know, it, it's really funny. I, I have a really good network of uh, trusted advisors that I can refer to, I believe. And then, you know, I was just recently going to build another small network group. Uh, I thought, you know, if I can get 10 or 12 people uh, that can all collaborate together, you know, from different industries, we can meet once a month, uh, we can exchange leads, but most importantly, we can work with one another with our clients. So the right hand knows what the left hand's doing during the whole process. So ironically enough, right when I was going to tee this up, I get an email from a group called High Rise. I guess I'm throwing a, a bone to High Rise right now. It's a network group, and, and it's all business owners and higher level top executives. And uh, I think it's going to be a good group. Uh, we had our first uh, virtual meeting last week. It seems like there's good members in it. And I think there's going to be good resources uh, to get clients, to get business. And uh, I'm really excited about it because, uh, you know, the networking, for instance, uh, Exit Advisors, we would have a band jam until COVID-19. And this band jam had been running for nine years. And we'd have 100 to 200 people show up. And these were all business owners, musicians. Uh, my office has a, has a uh, full music studio in it. So we'd have... Uh, three different setups, uh, venues for music, and of course we'd serve beer and wine and typically star pizza. But, you know, the networking was the real thrust of it. I mean, meeting people, just getting to know somebody, you know, in a different environment, uh, you know, outside of the stuffy walls of your office. And uh, I, I just highly encourage you, you know, to find a differentiator. Find something that you can do. Find something that you're really interested in and, and build a networking opportunity around that. I, I think it is something really, really important. Uh, you know, other groups that I'm involved in, I'm involved in entrepreneurs organization. Well, it's not a networking group. I mean, it's really an education group and it's a group of entrepreneurs. Uh, to qualify, you, you gotta have a business that's over a million dollars in revenues. But you get the network 
with people who have businesses who are like-minded and you know referrals do come from that i mean it, it you, you don't ask for referrals it's against the rules but people get to know one another and of course you become trusted advisors to some of these people and you get business from it and and that's a that's a great group to be involved with uh and then the trusted advisors uh you know, this is something that, that I've really focused on since I've been in Houston. It's something anybody in the service business I feel is important. So CPAs, bankers, attorneys, financial advisor, risk management, HR, IT, uh, you know, finding people in all of these areas that you can trust and you can send business to, and they can do the same for you. And, uh, you know, really what comes of that is you really get warm leads. You you get also, you have somebody watching your back. So it makes you a little bit more sticky. So let, let's say that, you know, you have a client, you bring the client to the attorney, you bring the client to the banker, and let's just play pretend this client gets upset with you for some reason. Well, you know something, the banker, the attorney may say, hey, you know, Gary's a good guy. Gary, you know, everybody's capable of making a mistake every once in a while. And they may actually be the people who keep your client in your database. So, you know, this, and having these trusted advisors is really important. And this is something else that Exit Advisors is doing. And what, what we've done is we've gone out and we find people to collaborate with. And we want to help you with your clients if they look at wanting to exit their business. And uh, being able to collaborate with us and doing so. Uh, like for instance, for CPAs, we'll, we'll teach you how to do a quality of earnings analysis. We'll we'll teach you how to do pre due diligence. We'll we'll teach you to do these things where you can stay involved with your client. Uh, and then you know when the exit is completed, you're still going to have a client because they're not going to go out to possibly another CPA firm that specializes in M and A. And so you know that that is just a good example of how we're collaborating now. And certainly, I, I refer business to my attorneys. And, uh, you know, with COVID-19, I bet everybody wishes they would have had a personalized banking relationship. And uh, that is something that I've always focused on to, you know, get with my banker at least monthly, get to know my banker, let my banker know exactly what I'm doing in my business. And uh, it certainly paid dividends uh, during COVID-19. Okay, so I am, I'm going to uh, qualify myself here uh, when we get into this digital marketing world. Uh, I'm not an expert, and I'll, I'll give you the warning you typically see when there, somebody is doing something really dangerous on TV, and they say, have an expert to do this, don't try it yourself, okay? And, but, you know, I think looking at the high level areas of digital marketing is important. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Uh, we, in 2019, we picked up 255 new clients, uh, primarily with digital marketing. And this year, I believe we're up to like 140 new clients. And so, you know, the new normal is digital marketing. It's something that really works. It's really effective. It's a way to put yourself out there to a large group of people and you can also target. So uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit of this and, and how to go about doing it. Uh, I'm gonna stumble through some notes and uh, just try to give you some real world experiences as well. So I remember uh, meeting a, a gentleman that, through Al Danto, Tyler Gillespie. And uh, you know, it was interesting. What happened is I was uh, on the phone with a potential new client and she said, you know, your website looks exactly like John Doe's website. Uh, did the same person build it? And you know, at that time, I had, the, I had a canned software, canned website. I thought it would work fine. I mean, it came with newsletters and updated all the technical information, all that good stuff. But you know, you really can optimize that. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about optimization. So, and also from a branding standpoint, I mean, 
it really didn't brand who I was. Uh, you know, when, when you go to build a website, first of all, it, it's got to be personalized. It's got to be authentic. And you've got to start out, you know, working with a professional and, and determine, all right, what is my brand? Uh, what is my target market? You know, what is my differentiators, my slogan? What is my voice? I mean, all these things are so very critical. And even color schemes, uh, the pictures that you put on your website. Uh, you know, with our website, I literally wrote our website. It was hair pulling. I, you know, and Tyler was all over me. It, it was like, you know, I had to put myself on a schedule to get all of this stuff completed because it, it had to be authentic. It had to basically talk about who Cooper CPA Group was. And then we did the same thing for Exit Advisors. We, we basically hand did our website. It's, it's something, you know, we, we looked at our color scheme, we looked at our pictures, you know, we looked at our slogans, what we represented. And, you know, that's what we put in the website because, you know, realistically, that's your foundation. That, that's, that's what people are gonna come to see. That's what prospects are gonna come to see. That's, that's what people are gonna come to see when you have landing pages and, and you're out there doing pay for clicks and you're you know, doing organic marketing on Google. People are gonna come in and they're, they're gonna really judge you a lot based on what your website says, what the content is, and believe it or not, purely the appearance. They're gonna look at this and, and kind of get a feel for, for who you are. So, you know, you want to build an optimized website, uh, you know, the clear messaging and prominent calls to action are so very critical. I mean, th this is not a shotgun approach to marketing. This is a rifle approach. Th this is trying to target. This is trying to identify who you are, who your customer is, and how you're going to put them in the funnel and bring them in. And so, I mean, you're going to have specific landing pages for that purpose and, and these landing pages are going to have call to action they're going to have keywords uh, they're going to tie in nicely with your paper clicks uh, your google advertising and basically they're going to create a funnel they're, they're going to draw people in and so you're going to get ratings on google uh, and you hopefully Hopefully you're on the first page. Uh, you do that organically with SEO or, you know, the pay-per-clicks. You have that to where, you know, people will identify you quickly, but they got a place, they got to have a place to come. So that would be like you having a business and you don't have a parking lot, right? So people show up to your place of business and it's just one big building. There's no parking lot, so they can't get in. And what the landing page does is it direct, directs them in to who you are and what kind of information they're specifically looking for. And then it gives them an opportunity possibly, you know, to fill out a page, uh, you know, then to reach out to you for the specific service that you're offering. Uh, so setting up these landing pages, for instance, right now, we've got a couple of landing pages that we're working on at Cooper CPA Group. We, we have one that, that's dealing with, uh, you know, if your CPA is not calling you back, right? So like I said earlier, about 75% of our new business is where CPAs aren't returning phone calls or, you know, not being attentive to their clients. So we have a landing page on that. Uh, we also have a landing page on restructures. And so we feel like, you know, with COVID-19, something that's going to be coming, uh, unfortunately, it's like a delayed fuse, but I would think somewhere around October, November, December, there's gonna be an opportunity for restructures and that's gonna feed right into exit advisors because uh, you know, you go in and restructure a company, then obviously what they probably wanna do is sell it. Uh, you know, we've had landing pages for tax preparation, we've had landing pages for tax planning. So realistically, they're very specific uh, and, and they lead to the call of action to bring people in to the business. Uh, okay, SEO and PPC. So SEO is search engine optimization. So, so what is that? So that's organic. That, that's something, it takes a little bit of time to build this up because you're dealing with content, right? So blogs, videos, 
the content of your website, keywords, AdWords. I mean, you, you got to have everything built in to where people are going to see you and come into your website or come into your landing pages. And so, again, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to build that up, right? PPC, uh, pay-per-clicks, is, is something that's a little bit more immediate. So you're, you're going to have Google ads and people are going to, you're going to pay for them to click on you, but it, it's going to be more of an immediate thing. But once you turn that off, it's off. Uh, you know, the SEO is going to continue because it's organic and it's something that is, uh, continue to be built. Uh, and then the algorithms uh, that kind of go along with this as well. See, Taylor, I said it right. Uh, so algorithms is something, you know, Google will change these. So this is why it's so very important. Uh, we have somebody that works for here for us full time. Taylor is awesome. She, she, uh, she's watching Google all the time. She's making sure when they change her algorithms that, that we're able to adjust and we're able to pivot and uh, kind of follow that. And then, you know, the pay-per-clicks, I mean, we, we are running Google ads all the time uh, with the landing pages and with the purpose and the call of action and with the keywords. So all of this comes into play uh, when you're setting up your digital marketing. And realistically, just to add to that, it's best to have both uh, going at the same time, uh, you know, basically to, to build up your brand, build up your reputation. And along with that, that's really, really important too, is, is Google reviews. And so the Google reviews for us has been a game changer. Uh, I believe we have around 54 Google reviews now. And uh, it's something you really ought to ask your customers that you've done a good job for it. They would do that for you. It's, uh, it will really help from a marketing standpoint. And then you say, well, what happens if I get a negative review? Well, you know, you need to be polite. You need to respond. You can't ever come off angry and you can't ignore it. Uh, we We have really funny we have one negative review and uh so anyway what happened is i was in china during busy season probably wasn't a good idea but somebody called and wanted to set up a, a consult or a meeting and at that time it was a week before deadline so we were charging uh for those meetings and uh the person didn't like that very much so they wrote a negative google review and but we don't know i think i know who it is but we don't know for sure because we couldn't find the person and uh and so anyway what happened it's kind of funny story i identified who i thought it was and uh so i called them and and set up a meeting with them they ended up becoming a client and uh i mentored them a little bit as well and uh but the google review was never taken down which was really kind of funny to me but I, I still have identified the fact i think that's who it was but when we responded to it we were polite you know we basically gave a good you know good reasoning behind it and that's just what you got to do uh okay email campaigns email campaigns are something that you know we run all the time we we really don't have a large newsletter uh, you know, we do a lot of things through email campaigns, email blast. Uh, it, it's just uh, being able to reach out to people with tidbits of information, uh, with call of action. Uh, we, we really were really effective with this during the uh, PPP loan cycle, uh, you know, really identifying what was going on, what changes were coming about. Uh, you know, what we could do to help our clients, to help our customers uh, get their PPP and their idle loans. And, and so we felt that was very important. Uh, and we're always doing email campaigns, for instance, for tax planning, uh, tax preparation, call of action, you know, it's time to get your information in. Any kind of deadlines that's coming about, uh, we have found that it, it's really important to reach out to our clients that way. And, uh, you know, most people, entrepreneurs are on the run, I mean, but, but they read their emails. 
especially if you kind of keep it short and sweet. We we don't want to really want to get voluminous uh, in our writing. I, I'm I'm a big proponent to outline formats. I, I think it's critical that you give somebody that they can simply look at something, uh, get their head around it, uh, understand, and then if they need to make a phone call, of course we provide all the information that they can directly call us and get more information with that. And it works also very effectively with social media. And so, you know, we're, we're doing both. We're running social media campaigns, we're running email campaigns, and then we have our website. So everything just kind of melts down and works together. Uh, but social media, I think one thing that Taylor's uh, taught me in, in the early stages was you don't overdo it. Uh, at one time, I was like posting things almost daily uh, to my social media. And that, that's just something that, that really, you know, you, you probably want to stay away from. Uh, you, you need, like anything else that's interesting, this whole digital marketing concept, it's, it's really deep strategy around it. Uh, you've got to have a plan. And like we keep a marketing calendar. And so our marketing calendar lays out, it lays out our social media, it lays out our email campaigns, it lays out our landing pages, it lays out, you know, what market we're going for at any given time. Because a CPA practice is seasonal. Uh, and so there's different calls of action that we have on a monthly basis with all of our campaigns and they all tie together. And, and so I would encourage you to do the same. And it's obviously it's all drawn towards who your customer is, what type of service they need at any given time. And, and so tying all this together in a bundle and making sure it's well coordinated is critical. Well, I gotta tell you, I am an entrepreneur and I'm, re I'm really more of a visionary, like I said earlier. And there's no way on God's great earth I could tie this bundle together. So, you know, if I did this, it would be kind of like, you know, when you start wrapping Christmas presents and uh, your wife is really smart about this. She gets the same kind of wrapping paper. And so you look under the Christmas tree and everything looks really color coordinated and it looks nice. Well, my Christmas tree, if I tried to handle all this digital marketing myself, it would look like I had a hundred different types of wrapping papers and nothing would probably be coordinated well together and uh, you know, it wouldn't get to the point. So what would happen it was it would come off almost like a shotgun approach uh, instead of a rifle approach. And, and we talked about that earlier, you know, making sure you have your target. And so in the early planning stages, finding that customer, defining a service, finding who you wanna reach, what your market reach is gonna be geographically, uh, and then, you know, profiling your customer. And believe it or not, with digital marketing, you can do that. You can profile your customer and you can reach them. And uh, it's something that we as a firm continue to do more and more. It, it, it typically just gets refined. It gets refined again. Uh, you know, you need to pivot. You need to look at other potential opportunities, uh, but it does, it does all work together. Uh, cash flow. Next time, we're, we're going to get into the cash flow of a business. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, how, how to operate the internal functions of a business, look at KPIs, uh, you know, look at specifics uh, when it comes to managing the internal framework uh, of a service organization. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I know I jumped around a little bit, especially on the, uh, the digital marketing side of it. Uh, if there's any questions out there, I would certainly love to answer them. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, uh, guys, I mentioned in the chat, if you didn't get a chance to submit any questions beforehand during the registration, feel free to throw them in the chat. We've got a few. Uh, Gary, I'm going to kick off your way. Um, if you're ready, sure. uh, the first that we have is if you're, if you're, is it better to start your own network or to join an existing one that's already established? Well, okay. I, like I said earlier, I built my network and when I moved to Houston, my first choice would be if you have the time, uh, you have the bandwidth to build your own network. 
uh, because you're the guy in charge. And typically the person's in charge has the opportunity to get the most business. And you also have control over the direction of the network. Uh, you know, what the affairs are gonna be, uh, you know, what, what the goals and objectives are gonna be, uh, meeting times, things of that nature. And so I think that's really beneficial. And, you know, an easy way to start a network is all you have to do is pick two or three people. I'd right? have lunch with them and basically have a roadmap of all the different job functions or types of people you want in your network. And four people can do more than one. And so, you know, the four people have lunch, lay the list out, let everybody go out and find about three people. And then it starts building that way. Then all of a sudden your next meeting, you've got 12 people. And the 12 people, it's basically, hey, these are the job functions that we're looking for. This is the type of people we want in the network. And believe it or not, within about six months, you could probably build a network up of 25, 30 people. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier, there's a couple of other networks. There's a network in action. Uh, I think Scott Talley does a good job. Uh, there's BNI. And uh, then I just joined a group called High Rise, which uh, I think is gonna be a good network group. Uh, people that I'm associated with, at my first meeting last week, uh, they're all business owners or higher levels in their companies. And so I think there's gonna be some great opportunity there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Looks like Dave actually just submitted a question. What tools do you recommend using to profile your potential customers? Uh, boy. From a standpoint of the digital marketing, uh, you know, I, I, I think what we try to do here is we identify, for instance, we like to do business with entrepreneurs. That, that's that, that is our profile customer. Uh, Jason Knight's on here and he, he helps with EOS. And, you know, we identified who, who was our customer, uh, how do we profile this customer? And I went through our client base as well. And I looked at the size of the businesses and really tried to identify who our customer already was. And, uh, and so then what we do from a standpoint, Taylor will take that and then our landing pages and our or pay for clicks and everything really is surrounded around going after small business owners. Now we do get other types of, of customers, uh, but, but that's really how we profiled. And I guess we, we've done it almost the old fashioned way uh, instead of using, you know, any kind of software or any kind of apps or anything like that. Yeah, and I can touch on that a little bit too, Dave. Um, as far as profiling internally, you know, I think that that's going to be, you know, up to the business owner figuring out who their audience is. But as far as targeting them, um, you know, for example, we use a lot on LinkedIn. There's also Facebook and other platforms. But a lot of these paid uh, target searches and ad and advertising that you can conduct will help you narrow down those demographics. So it'll allow you to do age group, company size, uh, geographic area, industry, subsectors within an industry. Um, there's a lot of helpful tools already embedded in these platforms. So if you haven't actually kicked off those marketing, I think you'll be pleased to see what there's, you know, what's available out there. I was just going to add add to that real quickly if I can. Uh, yeah, again, my, my name is Jason Knight, and as Gary mentioned, I do uh, EOS a lot. Uh, I'm an implementer uh, for clients based in Houston, and, and typically we'll go through that exercise. So before you go out and spend too much money on the social media profiling, you really need to understand your own target client really well. So we'll go through the demographic, the geographic, psychographic profile kind of the discovery process to make sure you understand who your ideal target client is. Then when you go into the uh, social media and the other marketing campaigns, you, you're real specific on where you're spending your money and your time uh, targeting those clients. Yeah. It can get really expensive very quickly. Yeah. You need to be able to have control over that. Um, a thing that I always took away from Gary, you know, he's done a very successful 
full-time job marketing um, online and, and digitally. It's being able to also control the faucet and turning it on and off, um, you know, as you do your campaign. So uh, uh, and I'll, add, I'll add to that a little bit, Andrew. I, I, tell, I tell you what the hardest, one of the most difficult things for an entrepreneur to do uh, when they're profiling is say no. Okay. So, and I have the hardest time with this in the world is I have a hard time saying no uh, to the new client meeting. So that I don't think really meet our profile. And I've understood that a lot of really successful businesses, they say when you truly get successful is when you learn to say no. And you only take that profile customer instead of taking everything. So. I agree. Gary, real quick, <laughs> while we're kind of on this topic, um, we had two questions around SEO and, and web development. Um, for example, earlier you mentioned canned websites. Um, that's actually new to me as well. Would you recommend using like an industry industry specific to can website that already has all the bells and whistles built in or how you know would you take a different approach no i would not recommend that uh that's exactly what we had previous to developing our own website and you know that's where the person called and said hey gary your website looks just like john's i mean and and plus from from an seo standpoint and keywords and authenticity uh, you know, really, your website should be you. Uh, I mean, it should breathe. It should have breath. It, it, it should be something that when people visit your website, they know you before they show up to your office. And really, the only way that you're going to be able to develop that is do it yourself and have the right people around you. Obviously, you know, you can put stuff together. You need to have professional writers. You need to have people who who take what you write and, and make it sound grammatically better, all right, and more active sentences. But it's something I believe that should be built from the handle. It's not something that you should go out and buy and put in place. Uh, I, know that, I know that Taylor, like, you know, putting keywords and things like that and making sure those keywords tie into the landing pages, tie into the Google advertising, everything, I don't think you can do that with a canned site. And that, that actually ties into the next question. Um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned using particular verbiage and wording. Um, that's really key with search engine optimization. So would you hire an external SEO company to do that? Or would you try to do it in house? What's your strategy there? Well, I think either would work. I think it just depends uh, who you are and what you want. I think it's really interesting how mine evolved. I mean, mine evolved by hiring a consultant, okay? And the consultant helped me develop the website. And then I was blessed with finding Taylor. And Taylor, I think, knew more than all of us. Uh, I still do. And, and so we're able to really maneuver here. We're, we're able to, you know, adjust and pivot. Uh, you know, especially with things like COVID-19 all of a sudden hits and you have somebody in-house and you can really make things happen quickly. Uh, you know, even with Exit Advisors, the way that, you know, we've kind of pivoted, we're really going to put a landing page out on merger acquisitions and, and uh, you know, go back into business valuation, put some stuff out there. I think you can be a little bit more fluid uh, if you have somebody in-house. However, there's some great companies out there that do SEO, and it's something that an entrepreneur may not want in-house. They, they, they probably would rather outsource it, and these guys are very effective. But it's like anything else, when you're hiring a professional, you need to advertise, you need to find out who they are, you need to get recommendations, and you need to look at their work, uh, you know, and see if it fits your grid. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, well, thank you for that. Uh, the last question that I have here is, uh, kind of around the, the advisors that you work with, what trusted advisors are important to collaborate with and how often would you talk or meet with them? Well, I mean, for me, uh, 
I think a banker, okay? So a banker is, is somebody who I typically meet with my banker. I try to meet with them monthly. Uh, I've come to grips with not getting referrals from my banker. Uh, you know, I, I just, I don't worry about that in that capacity. Uh, my banker takes care of me. They, they take care of if I need funding, if I want to go buy another practice, uh, you know, lines of credit, things of that nature. And especially with COVID-19, I mean, I was first in line for the PPP and uh, I just think it's critical. Plus, my banker gives me good insight, you know, from a standpoint of where things are headed, especially in the banking world where lending's headed. And I also have a great referral source for my clients. And so I think that's equally important that I trust my banker and I think he does good work. And so I can send my customers to him and they can take care, he can take care of their financing needs and their banking. Uh, attorney, uh, I'd probably talk to my attorney weekly and uh, I find it very valuable. I think, you know, the insight that my attorney has is different than the insight of an accountant. Plus, you know, we all have issues uh, when we're running businesses of, contractual agreements with collections with all of all those things all of the above and uh, having the attorney you know available to especially if you have a good relationship they'll take your call and uh, you can get quick answers and once again referring business to this attorney uh, I feel totally uh, you know that, that he's going to take care of my clients and take care of my customers and do a good job for them and I have two or three attorneys that I refer to though um, IT uh, we, we all need a good IT consultant now if we have a small business. Uh, to be honest with you, I wouldn't want an in-house IT person. It kind of reminds me of the movie Jurassic Park. Uh, I just, I wouldn't want somebody to have that much control over my systems and possibly be able to put a bomb in them. Uh, risk management, insurance, uh, I, I find that valuable to have somebody, you know, to refer to that can take care of my customers or medical insurance, uh, 401k plans and such, uh, I think is very, very important. Uh, investment banker, everybody I network with an investment banking firm called Exit Advisors. And, uh, you know, it just having insight for your customers if they're thinking about succession plans or, you know, thinking about exit strategies, uh, having that contact and having that somebody that you know that you can bounce things off of. Uh, but, you know, I, I just, I feel like almost every profession is important. And one thing we pride ourselves in is referring. Uh, we, we do know a lot of people and we're able to refer people when they have a need. Perfect. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for all the insights. Um, you know, we're, we're coming up here on the hour, so we'll, we'll let everyone get out of here and get to lunch. But, um, Make sure to tune in next week. We're going to have uh, Jason Knight. He's going to be going through uh, cash flow management for your business. And then Gary will pick up on the second part of his series towards the end of July. But, uh, you know, again, we'll have weekly town halls covering different subjects for small business and entrepreneurs. I hope you find this all helpful um, and look forward to having you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.